Hello there, everyone. Today, we're going to be continuing with the story of the museum tour guide and the little girl who was drawing. If you enjoy this kind of content, the like and subscribe button right there. Anyhow, I hope you enjoy. And if you are new here, I'll leave the first part in the description below. And let's get started. <laughs> we saw a few distant visitors along the way to the first room. They roared with laughter, screamed. I ushered her along with me, holding her hand tight. For a while, things were much calmer in the forest room. I explained to the girl that it was partly an aviary, and reassured her that the birds still got sunlight through the glass ceiling when it was daytime. Though, this evening only moonlight beamed in to the museum's indoor forest. Rosie and I startled a few birds crunching the bark upon the ground as we delved deeper. Quiet, Rosie. I gestured this time. Yes, we have to be quiet. I pointed to a display next to us that was a wedge between two well-trimmed trees. It was dark, but we managed to make out the shape of a person inside. That tree looks like a man, she gestured. That's because it is. Her eyes lit up as I whispered, still clenching her hand tightly. An experiment gone wrong. We house it here so it can sleep. He's not human. Not anymore. Feast through his roots or anyone stupid enough to get close to him. Nothing could be heard in the dark indoor forest. Only that of the crunching leaves as she moved to press her nose against the glass with a screech. Rosie, I whispered, don't make too much noise. What's his name? No name. I gently pulled her away from the exhibit. Though some guests call it the Slumber Ghoul. He is relatively harmless, though one of our poor, poor janitors fell asleep in here during one of those long evenings. Never woke up ever again. Her hand tightened around mine. They say he eats you through your dreams, I whispered. And if you're really tired, you don't even have to be asleep to feel it happening. That was all I had to say. She pulled my arm in a hurry towards the door. Sorry for scaring you, Rosie. We had almost made it to the back door when a couple of blue butterflies fluttered and landed on her hair. She almost lifted one onto my finger. When leaves crunched and crunched behind us. One of the deplorable witch people had found us. He was scrambling around in the dark, reaching out with hands unable to see. His hands met the cabin at the house of the tree man. The idiot sounded like sounded the loud honk as his fingers slid across the glass. Without warning, he smashed the glass, cackling as he ran out of the forest aviary and back to the holes. Rosie tried to free from my hand's grip, breaking into a sprint to no avail. It's okay, Rosie. The back door. Let's go. We jogged quickly through the trees, crunching bark and waking birds as we went. Running, running, running. The door into the aviary sounded like a clack. Somebody was locking us in. 
I jimmied the rusted doorknob at the back to no avail. The door first clicked, then bumped with a groan as it stubbed to a sudden shut. It widened little enough that I swore I wouldn't even be able to fit a few fingers through the gap. Something's in the way, I grunted. Suddenly, the girl drummed a few fist hammers on my leg. She kept hammering on the side of my leg. Rosie pouted a worried face to the artificial tree line before rummaging her face into one of my black pant legs. Away from something horrible and terrifying. Yonder the trees it towered with flesh irregular and charred black like an ashen log. Its mouth hung unhinged, wide open and ghoulish, its eyes vacant and white. It was watching us. Rosie, I held the girl by her shoulders. Rosie, it's okay. He can't get us. The girl looked up with glossy eyes. Monster! She gestured. It cannot touch us if we are well slept, I spoke. Stay awake, okay? I gave her a warm look, but it was quickly cracking. Mr. Sleepy! We shared a gaze for as long as she could muster before her eyes met the ground. Rosie, I want you to stay calm when you answer my question, okay? I had to balance my gaze between her and the thing in the trees. Rosie sniffed, then nodded. Did you sleep much on the flight to museum? My eyes darted to movement behind us, blackening stumps while legs should be slogged under the goo. Moving weighted like an unrooted oak. Every slow step it took made its torso contort with a sickening crack, as if its bones had snapped and twisted. Its mouth had since widened enough that it could fit Rosie's beautiful ripened head in. Rosie, did you sleep? Rosie? Like a fever dream, I saw blowflies crawling over her eyelids and her mouth, just like my dead daughter Sophia. Am I pretty, Daddy? I snapped out of it. Rosie, please. I boomed, shaking her. I had to get her out. I couldn't lose her. Not again. I shot up from my knees, launching her onto my shoulders and bolted towards the other door. Her head bounced around for a while as I ran. But when I steadied, we made it out the ghoul. It was looming close, a mere twenty paces away. Its torso flailed with a disjointed crack in directions perpendicular to its body. Hold on, I announced as I held a rosy to my chest. I extended a leg and launched a kick into the door. Curses under my breath could not drown out the sickening sound behind me. All I could think of was that I had to get Rose out and that its steps sounded like boot meeting snail. Get in! I said, and her shoes popped on the ground. This time, I held my kick as one shoe planted against the door. I could not open it wide enough for myself, but pressing the door with my boot made it grow wide enough for her to enter. For a split second, I worried about the rich people through the door, and in the halls too. One long, unending nightmare. I broke through. 
the rich people who had been blocking the door went sprawling like cockroaches under a bright light. They cackled maniacally as they ran through the halls. Almost gotcha! One of the rich men laughed as he went around a bend, his voice becoming distant as he ran. They couldn't keep getting away with this. They couldn't keep tormenting me in the museum for their sickening entertainment. Wait here, I told Rosie. She was a ball on the ground, shaking and sobbing. I shot up on one and then two legs in a rush and gave chase. The witch prick ran and ran, his hands screeching against the walls of the tight corridor. Our museum greenhouses on either side. You almost killed Rosie. Sprinting, I had almost caught up with him. He was in arm's reach. Stop running. His leg caught itself beneath one foolish stride. He went tumbling into one wall before pushing it off of it and into another, smashing the glass halfway tumbling to the greenhouse. Spectacles had come away from his face. Blood drained and trickled towards his scalp as he hung over shards of the broken window. Starlight flooded in from the greenhouse and blanketed his face in a greenish hue. Help me, he coarsely pleaded. One arm reached up at me, wanting to be pulled away from the glass of the safety. Inside Holy, our greenhouse of Venus flytrap, with a mouth to fit a man, twisted and loomed in the evening light. She was a ginormous, beautiful plant. Hungry, too. The man's head tilted backwards and set eyes on the plant. He wriggled and whirled, trying to free from the glass that stuck through him. I reached one hand outward to lift him, but I stopped myself. Rosie's smile glowed in my mind like hot steel. My daughter Sophia had that same smile. A smile he wanted to take away. My arm attracted. Lift me out of here, he croaked. Hurry! I glared at him unblinkingly. Then it was over. With one swift swoop, Holy swallowed his torso. Green hairy fingers from the lips snugly tightened around his body like mossy bandages. My employment contract had been broken, and I shall be punished. Globals of thick slime dripped from the flytrap's lips. Arms and legs burst out of her mouth as she chomped. When I returned to Rosie, I held her hand tighter than I had the entire evening. I held and held her hand all night until it was time for her ride to pick her up from the museum's courtyard. Broken glass and escaped exhibitions tended to be the majority of the damage, and for a few hours I swept. When everyone had all left, all that was left for me to do was sit at my reception table and wait for sunrise. My contract had been broken, I had let a de guest die at my hand. They were always all despicable, I suppose so. But that one had to die. Rosie's warmth had gripped me so tightly, dissipated hours after museum turned quiet. Everything was cold again. I miss my daughter. I'm sorry I couldn't protect you like Rosie. And there would be more rich guests that torment me next week. And there was no escape. I thought about the ocean exhibition I visited earlier in the evening. The anglerfish and I were one and the same. I love you, Sophia. Slumped on my table, I lay broken and bruised. I rested my head upon folded arms, ready to let sleep come to me. I hope I don't dream for you, my girl. I don't want to see the blowflies again. For a while, nothing, and something quite curious. For the third.
first time in 15 years, the museum's phone rang. If you want to see that, be sure to tune in next week and find out the fate of the tour guide.